So my name is Bryce Adelstein Lalbach. I work at NVIDIA. I'm the lead for the CUDA C++ Core Libraries team. I'm also a member of the C++ Standards Committee. I chair uh, the Library Evolution uh, Incubator Group and the Tooling Group. But originally, uh, I spent most of my time on the committee in SG1, which is the concurrency group. And my goal today is to uh, arm you with the language and mindset of uh, the C++ uh, committee's concurrency study group. So I, I want to equip you with like our mental model for how we think about C++. Um, and so I'm going to explain to you how uh, the C++ abstract machine works and the execution model for C++. So let's start off by talking about the abstract machine. Who here has heard of the abstract machine in the context of C++ before? All right, some hands here. So the abstract machine is a, a model um, which allows, it's, it's sort of a portable abstraction of your operating system, your kernel, and your hardware. The abstract machine is it's the intermediary between your C++ program and the system that it runs on. So it's not a real thing. It's not like a virtual machine or anything like that. It's just this sort of mental model that we use. So the idea is you write portable code in C++, and that portable code targets this abstract machine. And then various different concrete hardware platforms and operating systems implement the semantics of the abstract machine. So again, you, you write uh, portable code, it gets mapped down to the abstract machine model, and then various you can deploy it on various different architectures and platforms. So the abstract machine, it, it's actually very simple. The model is a collection of threads executing operations on objects that reside in some global flat storage. So you've got, you've got a group of threads, you've got some objects that live in storage, and those threads perform, op perform operations on those objects concurrently. That's it, like that's the whole execution model. It's very, very simple. So there, there's two key components, as I said. We'll go through each of them. So first, the storage model. So storage is flat in C++. There's no notion of hierarchy, like caches, et cetera. Objects reside in storage at a single memory location. Uh, some objects may not have a unique memory location, so uh, base classes that are eligible for the empty base class optimization, or objects that are marked with C++ 17's no unique address. But those are sort of exceptions to the rule. An implementation is allowed to store two objects at the same machine address, or not store an object at all, if it's not observable. So this is under what we call the as-if rule. So the, the implementation may optimize away the storage of an object. For example, like a constant, um, if, it, if it knows that it's not going to be needed at runtime, but only if you can't observe that it's been optimized away. So conceptually, every object in your C++ program exists at a location in storage. But that might not be the, the case in practice. So an object in C++ cannot have more than one memory location. This would sort of break the abstract machine. For example, imagine this class right here, where I have a, uh, a, the first line in its assignment operator is a self-assignment check. So I check, hey, this object that I'm, I'm going to assign um, to myself, I am I equal to it? Do I reside at the same address of it? And if objects could reside at multiple addresses, then this would break. So it's sort of a fundamental property of C++ that, that you have this mapping between a single memory location and a single end and object. So every thread in the program can potentially access every ob object and every function in a program. So every, not every thread might not have know the address of every object, but if it had the address of, a, of an object, it can access that object. So let's, let's take a look at a couple of examples of some concrete systems. So here's one where I've got some process, some operating system process um, that, that's running um, on top of some operating system that provides us with a virtual memory abstraction. And that virtual memory abstraction abstracts over some main memory. And there's some sort of caching system for the main memory. 
and then maybe I have two actual physical processor units, but they don't have any private memory. There's one single uh, uh, flat set of, of uh, main memory. So this system, this satisfies the, app, the, the constraints of the abstract machine. Every thread can access every location in memory. So this is good. So what if we've got multiple processes? Well, then we have a problem because if we have multiple processes, we might have memory that is private to each one of those processes, right? And so if we have memory that's private to some set of threads, that's not an implementation of the C++ abstract machine. So this is not a setup that, that this is not an, in, an instance of the C++ abstract machine. So what about if I've got a, a back to a single process, um, but now I have some sort of scratch pad memory um, that is only accessible on, uh, so I have scratch pad memory associated with each one of my two processors, and it's only accessible from that processor. So some threads will have access to that scratch pad memory, but some threads will not. This is not an implementation of the abstract machine, because again, we have some objects that not every thread can access. All right, so let's talk now about threads. So a thread of execution is a single flow of control in a program. A essentially, a thread of execution evaluates a function call. And threads may run concurrently, of course. So the main thread of execution, with the one that implicitly exists in all programs, it evaluates the main function. There's also std threads, which we're all probably familiar with. Std threads, you start them, you construct them with a function and they go and evaluate that function. So variables with static storage duration are initialized as a consequence of program initiation. So they're sort of, they're sort of special to the main thread because the lifetime of the program is sort of intrinsically tied to the main thread. So prior to the evaluation of, of main, static storage initi initialization happens, and after main has completed, static storage um, uh, is destroyed. So there's also variables with thread storage duration. Those are initialized as a consequence of thread execution. So for each thread, it's um, object of thread storage duration are initialized prior to the evaluation of the thread function, and they're destroyed after the thread function has completed. OK, so threads essentially evaluate a function call. But what does it actually mean to evaluate a function call? This seems like something that sort of, it's very basic, right? Like we all know what it means to evaluate a function call, but what does it actually, like what are the actual formal semantics of the evaluation of a function call? All right, we're gonna get into that. So first we have to talk about expressions because at the end of the day, evaluation breaks down to the evaluation of expressions. So an expression in C++ is a sequence of operators and operands that specify some computation. So for example, function call, or you know, a, something like operator plus, or a constructor, or um, a, uh, a direct initialization. These are all expressions. And the expressions that aren't just direct function calls they all pretty much get lowered down to function calls. If you ever look at a compiler's internals, you'll, you'll, you'll end up seeing this same structure, that eventually everything gets lowered down to an expression which consists of some function to call and some set of operands to call it with. So sub-expressions are part of a larger expression. So like right here, I've got this, uh, uh, this expression right here. And it's got a few sub-expressions. So first of all, let's start on the right here. We've got a plus b. That's an expression, and it's part of this larger expression. Then we've got c itself, which is an expression. We've got the dereference of f here, which is an expression. Then we have the call of whatever thing we just dereferenced. And then we have the call of the constructor of t from this direct initialization. So full expressions are defined as anything that's not a sub-expression. So a full expression is anything that's not a part of a larger expression. So for example, in an if statement here, the, this full expression includes the L value to R value conversion, um, a T, like the conversion of T to Boolean, and the call to operator equal equal. 
And here's another example of a full expression. This one's sort of a little bit unintuitive, which is there's a full expression at the end of this scope here that calls the destructor of t. So full expressions may include sub-expressions that are not lexically part of the expression. For example, if you have a function that has a default argument, like this f right here, when we call f, that's a full expression, and it includes the, the call to f, it also includes the call to g in the default argument of f, and potentially a constructor call to t. So the evaluation of an expression and it includes two parts. One are, are its value computations, and the second is its initiation of, of any side effects associated with that, that expression. So side effects are things that change the environment. There's three different types. There's reading a volatile object or modifying any object. There's calling a library I.O. function, which is just a term of art for a certain class of, of functions in the standard library. And then there's calling a function that does either of those two things. So in the first example here, we have a equals a plus b. This has a side effect because it modifies an object. It modifies a. The second one here, c out of a times a, again, this has a side effect because it calls a library I.O. function. The last one here, we don't know what foo does, but if foo has any side effects, then this will have the side effects because it calls foo. So value computations are pure and have no observable effect. So like in this example here, the a plus b, that, that's a value computation. That's not going to have any side effects. The completion of the execution of an evaluation does not imply the completion of its side effects, just the completion of its value computations. So what does this mean? It means when we evaluate this code here, c out of a times a, when that's done, it doesn't mean that the I.O. has actually happened. That might still be in the process of happening asynchronously under the hood, either in another thread or it's just buffered. But we don't have any guarantee that the side effect has completed. So given any two, um, next I'm going to go into explaining a couple of different relations that are sort of the core relations of the memory model and the execution model. The first of these is called sequence before. So given any two evaluations, A and B, that are within the same thread of execution, A is sequenced before B means that the execution of A precedes the execution of B. Note, of course, what I said about side effects. So because the, the completion of the execution of, of, a, of an evaluation doesn't mean that its side effects is completed, sequenced before does not necessarily mean that side effects have completed. So the sequence before relation is asymmetric. If A is sequenced before B, it doesn't imply that B is sequenced before A. And it's transitive. If A is sequenced before B and B is sequenced before C, then A is sequenced before C. So each full expression is sequenced before the next full expression in program order, where program order here essentially means the lexical order that you read the program. So like if you've got two statements, A and B, A is sequenced before B. If A and B are indeterminately sequenced, then either A is sequenced before B or B is sequenced before A. But, but you're not guaranteed which of those two is true. One of them is. But what you do know is that they're not interleaved. One happens before the other. If A and B are unsequenced, though, then A is not sequenced before B, and B is not sequenced before A. So it's possible that the, that the evaluation of those two things happens concurrently. Now again, we're still talking about just within one thread. So what we mean here is that the operation is actually interleaved. So these are the three relations. So sequence before means A happens before B. Indeterminate sequencing means A, either A happens before B or B happens before A. And then unsequenced, means either A happens before B, B happens before A, or they're interleaved, they overlap. 
So let's look at an example of this. So we're going to use a, uh, an example of the std for loop, which is a, a, a construct that's in the parallelism TSV2. I just like it because it's convenient for these little vectorization examples. So I've got this for loop here. It's, it's pretty simple. And when I evaluate this with a sequential execution policy from C17, I'm guaranteed that each iteration of this loop is going to be sequenced before the next iteration of this loop. So like this first iteration will happen in yellow here, then the second iteration in red, then the next one in blue, then the next one in purple. And as you can see, each one of these iterations consists of some like discrete uh, uh, operations. It's not like a fully atomic unit. But the compiler is not allowed to do any interleaving here. Now, if I say, if I change the policy from seek to unseek there, now I've given permission for each iteration to be interleaved. And so when this happens, it means that the compiler can, for example, take all of the loads of y and clump them together and take all of the loads of x from each iteration and clump them together, and et cetera for the, uh, the uh, fused multiply add and the store. And then what you can do is you can vectorize this. All right, so next let's talk about statements. So statements are compositions of full expressions, or that, at least that's how I like to think of them, insofar as the execution model is concerned. So when I have two statements, Statement 0 is going to be sequenced before statement 1 here. So if I have something like a conditional, the, the condition will be sequenced before the body. Likewise, for a while loop, the condition will be sequenced before the body. And for the for loop, the initializer will be sequenced before the condition and the, the increment. And, all, all of, and the initializer will be sequenced before the body. And then the rules are a little bit more complicated for um, each iteration, but you get the basic idea. So when calling a function, the functions are, are actually the most complicated uh, uh, in terms of ordering. There's four different rules here. The first rule is that every evaluation within a function and every evaluation not within a function are indeterminately sequenced. That's rule one. Rule two, the expression designating the function is sequenced before the argument expressions. So the expression that returns the actual function that you're calling, be it a function pointer or a function object, is sequenced before the arguments to that call. Each argument expression is indeterminately sequenced with respect to all other argument expressions. This can be a little surprising, as we're going to get into in a minute. And finally, every expression in the body of the function is sequenced after the expression designating the function in every argument expression of the function. So let's look at an example. That'll, that'll help. So here we have a function b that has, takes some arguments, and it has some expressions inside of it. We'll call those expressions inside of it e. Then we have a call to a function g, which takes three arguments. The first is a, and then the last one is f. And then we have. The, the second argument um, is a call to B with two arguments, C and D. So A and E are indeterminately sequenced here, according to rule one. F and D are indeterminately sequenced here. B, so, so when I say B in parentheses here, I mean the expression that, that, that denotes the function that I'm going to call is sequenced before C and D. So you have to figure out what you're going to call before you evaluate the arguments that you're going to call it with. Then C and D are indeterminately sequenced. And C and D are sequenced before E. And then A through F are all sequenced before the body to G. So by applying these, these four rules, you can sort of figure out what actually happens. But as you can see, it's not exactly straightforward, unfortunately. So I want to briefly talk about initializers list so I can show you an example. Um, it, when you have a brace initializer, each element of the brace initializer is sequenced before all the subsequent elements 
of the brace, initial brace initializer. This might be the behavior that you would expect from function arguments. You might expect that A would be sequenced before the second argument, and that would be sequenced before F, but that's not the case. All right, so I've got a simple example here. I've got a class, a struct A. It has a constructor that takes an int. And then I'm going to create a tuple with two elements of this type. And in the first case here, I'm using uh, parens, so traditional construction. And in the second case here, I'm using braces. So what will the output of these two calls be? Anybody? You look like you want to guess. Yeah, go for it. Gotcha. Okay, so, so what, what he said was the first one's not guaranteed. It's either 0, 1 or 1, 0, and the second one is 0, 1. That's correct. So with GCC, for the first one here, you'll get 1, 0, and for the second one here, you'll get 0, 1. For Clang, though, you'll get something different. You'll get 0, 1 for the first one here, and you'll get 0, 1 for the second one here. So again, you'll get some implementation divergence in the first one here because the arguments to a function uh, are indeterminately sequenced. We tried to fix this in C++11, but we were unable to for compatibility reasons. Basically, we didn't want to have to make the breaking change to compilers that did what GCC does today. It's unfortunate, but it's the world we got to live in. So the value computations, but not the side effects of an operator, are sequenced before the value computations, but not the side effects of its operons. Sorry, was there a question? OK. Yeah? Uh, um, you're asking if the second one can be more optimal than the first? Yeah, so, th so that argument's been made. The argument's been made that the first one's better because it, it preserves implementation freedom to optimize the order of evaluation. Um, but in practice, no compiler optimizes based on this. Every compiler just picks an order. It's just the case that GCC picked one order, MSVC picked one order, and Clang and LLVM picked a different order. They don't actually do any heuristics on it. They just say, we're going to always do this order. In theory, like, like there's been some research done about whether you could optimize for this. Um, uh, there wasn't really any noticeable impact. And um, there was also some evaluation done as to what was the performance impact of switching the order in compilers. And there was some impact, um, but it was not a lot. So I, I would not prefer the one that has indeterminate sequencing um, for the sake of optimization, because in practice, it's not actually going to be any faster. All right, so next we're going to talk about operators. Um, no. The it, in practice, it is. In practice, with each compiler, you'll get one of the two behaviors. But that's not guaranteed. So you shouldn't rely on it. Like, you're, you're, a compiler could decide, or based on each evaluation, to order things differently. It just happens to be the case today that GCC always orders things from right to left, and Clang always orders things from left to right. But they could make that decision on a per evaluation basis. All right, so next we're going to talk about operators. So the value com computations of an operator are sequenced before the value computations of its operands. This sort of falls out of uh, uh, some of the rules we talked about earlier. So the following uh, operators are evaluated, um, sequenced left to right. So these, these all sort of make sense. Um, for the logical operators, the shift operators, comma operator, it's all pretty straightforward. So these operators are sequenced from right to left. So assignment and any, and any compound assignment. And this sort of makes sense because when you are assigning to something, you want to figure out what you're assigning bef before you, you figure out what you're assigning it to. All right. So that's 
evaluation in a nutshell. So, so this whole sequenced before relation we've talked about, it's important to understand that this is all within one thread. Sequenced before is a relation that happens within a single thread. It has nothing to do with evaluations outside of a thread. There is another relation that describes ordering between different threads, and that's called synchronizes with. So two different library operations may be related to each other via the synchronizes with relation. Synchronizes with is asymmetric. So if A synchronizes with B, it does not imply B synchronizes with A. There are five different ways to achieve uh, synchronizes with in the library today. There might be a few new ones in C++20. Um, I have not updated this slide for that, but they are atomic acquire and release semantics, mutex lock and unlock, thread creation and joining, and future promises, and parallel algorithm fork and join. So by that I just mean the, the invocation of a parallel algorithm and the completion of all of the tasks that it spawns. So synchronized with is a runtime relation. You only have it if the operation sees it. So in this example here, I have one thread on the left that is assigning to some data and then is storing a one to some atomic. And then on the right, I have a thread that is loading from that atomic and if that atomic has a value that's one, it's going and doing something with the data. So if this condition is true on the right here, if we saw the value of one that was written by the other thread, then we have a synchronizes with relation, which means that we get to see any operation that happened in the thread on the left prior to that, uh, uh, that store. So anything that was sequenced before that store and that thread on the left, we get to see. But only because we saw that store happen. And so thus, when we, um, when we assign from the data on the right here, we get to see a copy of the data, the copy of the data that was assigned to by the thread on the left. Now, let's say that that comparison failed. So we did the load, but we got a value of zero. Then we have no synchronizes with relationship. We don't know anything about, about uh, the operations that have happened in the thread on the left. We haven't synchronized with them. We, we don't have any ordering guarantees. You, you can't synchronize from a load to a store. You can only synchronize from a store to a load. All right, so another example, mutex unlock operations. So mutex unlock lock operations synchronize with all subsequent mutex lock operations. So in this first um, scope here, I lock some mutex, and then when I unlock it, it synchronizes with all subsequent lock operations that occur in any thread. So my assignment of data in this, scope to niche, in this uh, uh, locked scope here is seen by anybody who locks the mutex after me, which is exactly the semantics that you would expect. All right, so we're going to now talk about another relation, which is arguably the most important relation uh, for the C++ execution model, which is called happens before. So, yeah. Yes, the question was, every lock is actually a memory barrier. You have to flush your cache on every unlock operation. The answer is yes. Yes. Locks, or, or unlocking a mutex in C++, is a memory fence. It, it doesn't cost you much to have this, though. Oftentimes, the way that you, most, most mutex implementations um, uh, end up involving a a store to an atomic variable anyways, so you, you, you often just get this for free. This is very cheap to have, and you, you more or less would want it anyways. It would be surprising if you didn't get this effect. Yes, yes. Well, as, assuming that you have the correct memory order. So acquire release 
or stronger gives you this guarantee. But relaxed operations, relaxed operations give you nothing. Yeah. All right, so given any two, so now we're gonna talk about happens before. Given any two evaluations, A and B, if A happens before B, then A is sequenced before B, or A synchronizes with B, or for some evaluation X, a happens before B and X happens be or before S. Sorry, A happens before X and X happens before B. So happens before is built up from sequences of sequence before operations and synchronizes with operations. So happens before doesn't actually mean that something happened before the other thing. I know, I know. All right, so let's look at an example of that. So we have on the left here, I've got um, two global ints and a function foo. And in foo, I have two assignments, one where I do x equals y plus 1, and one where I do y equals 1. And you can see in the assembly that's generated on the right here that the second operation actually happens sort of in the middle of the first operation here. So it happens prior to the add in the first operation and prior to the store of the first operation. Now, the reason why this is fine is because th this is not observable. There were, there were no side effects from this first operation or the second operation that required um, x equals y plus 1 to actually happen before y equals 1. So in this case, x does happen before y because x is, because this assignment here is sequenced before the, the second assignment, even though that's not what actually happens in practice. So happens before doesn't mean happened before. And happening before doesn't mean that you have a happens before relation. Yeah. Sorry, I couldn't hear you. Probably not. The question was, will this happen without optimization? I'm pretty sure I wouldn't have put the 03 in there if, if we didn't need it. All right, so we, we talked about happens before doesn't mean happened before. Happening before doesn't mean happens before as well. All right, so let's say we've got some std atomic that we're going to use as a guard variable and we have some data. And we've got two threads, a producer and a consumer. In the producer thread, just like we did before, we assign some value to the data, and then we store true to the, the, the flag variable. Notice we use memory order relaxed here. Then in the consumer, we have an if, where we do if ready.load, so, so if we see a true value, then we go and do something with the data. So, this program has undefined behavior. The reason is that we use memory order relaxed here, and memory order relaxed gives us no memory ordering guarantees. So it is possible that this second thread here reads a value of true from the atomic bool, but when it goes to use data, it does not see the store that happened prior to the store of true by the first thread. So even, even though that, that store of 42 to data happened before the store of true to ready, it's not the case that another thread will see things that way because we used memory order relaxed, which is the weakest of the memory orders. Now, if we, try, if we change this to what we had in the other examples where the store was memory order release and the load was memory order require, we wouldn't have this problem. Likewise, if we used um, sequ the sequential consistency order, we wouldn't have this problem. Okay, so happens before describes arbitrary concatenations of sequenced before and synchronizes with. And again, sequenced before is an ordering within a thread, and it's a consequence of the program order, a consequence of the order that you write code. Whereas synchronizes with is a relationship between threads which you achieve by calling certain library functions, like atomic acquire and release, 
operations or mutex lock and unlock operations. All right, so next we're going to actually talk about execution. So the evaluations executed by threads are delineated by what we call execution steps. So, yeah. Um, happens before is transitive, kind of. Let's go back to the definition here. Um, yes, um, I suppose I could have I could have described this as transitive. If A happens before X and X happens before B, um, uh, then you have a happens before relationship between A and B. So the standard doesn't describe it this way for probably odd reasons, but it is in fact transitive. All right, we were here. All right, so execution steps. So the evaluations executed by threads are delimited by execution steps. So an execution step is a determination of the thread, an access of a volatile object, or the completion of a library I.O. function, or a synchronization operation, so something that synchronizes with, or an atomic operation. So those, are, those, three, those three things are execution steps. So this slide's probably a little bit out of order. Um, we'll go back to that in a second. Uh, actually, that's probably in the right place. All right, so let's talk a little bit about, uh, about atomic operations. So atomic operations may fail spuriously um, due to interference from other threads. So this means that, that like, an atomic operation may not succeed even if the, the condition that it's checking for is true. Uh, implementations are encouraged but not required to, present, to prevent spurious failures from indefinitely delaying progress. So it, it is possible that due to random interference that your atomic operation may just fail forever, that the condition that you're waiting for may always fail, even if you've really done nothing wrong. Okay, so next let's define blocking. So, Blocking is when we wait for some condition to be satisfied before continuing execution. So there's a set, set series of library functions that we call blocking library functions. And we consider these to be functions that continuously execute execution steps while waiting for their condition to be satisfied. And the idea here is that um, they eventually make progress because they are always executing execution steps. And as long as a thread executes execution steps, it is making forward progress. Yeah. Yep. Yep. What it means, so the question was, if I have an atomic integer and you, integer, and you increment that integer, is it, is it possible that it can fail without any reason? So incrementing an, an integer um, will, at, like, like using the increment op operator on an integer, on an atomic integer in C++, will um, actually call fetch add or, or call a, a cast loop. Um, so that will, um, like if that succeeded, it means that the value has actually been stored there. Um, now, if you're calling fetch add on an atomic integer in a loop, um, yes, it, uh, it's possible that that could spuriously fail forever. Or, or more importantly, if you have like a compare exchange loop, um, it is possible that that, could, that that compare exchange could never succeed due to um, uh, interference from other threads. So like everybody else in the system is also trying to update that, that atomic. And you might get starved forever. However, implementations are encouraged to not do that. Uh, sorry, even on what? Yeah.
Yes. Yes. Like, like, like any, any, atom, any atomic operation that can fail spuriously falls victim to this. There are a few that can't. I think like compare exchange strong, but I'm not, I'm not sure about that. Yeah, so, so look, in practice, in reality, um, no implementation will indefinitely delay you. Um, it's just not strictly guaranteed. So y yes, you will eventually make progress on all implementations I'm aware of. Uh, but it's not a strong guarantee. And one of the reasons it's not a strong guarantee is it would be difficult to, to specify when exactly you, you like, like in what duration do you have to guarantee that this operation will succeed. That's very difficult, difficult to specify. In practice, yes, but but um, uh, spurious failures can can get pathological, and it might take a lot longer to succeed than you'd like. All right, it's so blocking library functions. We just talked about how they made progress. So blocking library functions continuously execute execution steps while waiting for some condition to become true. Okay, so. Forward progress guarantees that something observable eventually happens. So as long as threads are executing execution steps, eventually the program will reach its conclusion because observable things are happening, and as long as everybody's doing observable things or everybody's waiting for observable things to happen, eventually, given enough time, everybody will make progress. So implementations are allowed to assume that all threads will eventually perform an execution step. This has the interesting side effect that infinite loops, which that have no observable effects, are actually undefined behavior. And thus, the compiler may optimize those away. So if you have an infinite loop that has no observable side effects, the compiler can just delete that. It doesn't have to execute it because it's allowed to assume that all, your thre that all threads eventually uh, perform an execution step. And so your infinite loop has undefined behavior. So I'm just going to, I'm just going to choose that the undefined behavior will be, will never execute. All right. So there's three classes of forward progress guarantees in the standard. There's concurrent forward progress, parallel forward progress, and weekly parallel forward progress. So concurrent forward progress guarantees ensure that the thread will make progress regardless of whether other threads are making progress. This is the strongest form of progress guarantee in C++. So some examples of things that give you concurrent forward progress guarantees, preemptive OS thread scheduling, or an unbounded thread pool, which will add new threads if it becomes oversubscribed. Um, Lock-free and wait-free are related to the, I'm not sure I understand your question, are related to the, the forward progress guarantees in that they describe, um, they describe how atomic operations work, which are the basis of happens-before relations. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so th th those are the terms of art that we use to describe how atomic operations work, and what atomic operations give you are happens-before relationships. All right, so parallel forward progress. Parallel forward progress it guarantees that once the thread has executed its first execution step, the thread will make progress. It will run into completion. But So basically, once it's started running, it will run until completion. So for example, um, something like a bounded thread pool, or like what most of you would just think of as a traditional thread pool, so you have some fixed set of worker threads that are executing tasks. This provides parallel forward progress. Um, threads on modern NVIDIA GPUs provide uh, uh, parallel forward progress. And then we have weekly parallel forward progress, um, which is just sort of the lack of forward progress guarantees. Weekly parallel uh, uh, threads are not guaranteed to make progress. 
So some examples, non-preemptive OS thread scheduling, um, suspendable user space tasking, so like work stealing task schedulers, fibers, um, things like lazy execution, C++ coroutines, um, or threads on older GPUs or GPUs not made by my company. All right, so what guarantees does the main thread make in C++? What do you think? The strongest one? That would be nice. It's implementation defined. Now this actually makes sense because you might be on some weird embedded platform where you've only got one core, you don't actually have any threads, and you know, if like an interrupt comes in or some, some OS thing needs to happen, you might like have to interrupt your user code. So it would be, it would be too restrictive to require every implementation to ensure that the main thread uh, provides you with concurrent guarantees because that basically requires you to have an OS thread, thread uh, scheduling system that will make forward progress. And that, that's sort of beefy, especially for embedded platforms. All right, what about std threads? What guarantees do they make? Yeah, that's right, of course. They have to make the same type that main would have to make, so which is implementation defined. If you're on a traditional platform that has an operating system, you'll almost always get concurrent guarantees for std thread and for the main thread. But if you're on an embedded operating system, that might not be the case. Or for example, on Windows, I don't think that this is necessarily the case with something like a GUI thread doesn't give you um, uh, concurrent uh, forward progress. All right, so last thing we're gonna talk about is possibly the most confusing part of the execution model, which is boost blocking. So boost blocking is when you block on a thread with weaker forward progress guarantees, and you do so in a way that preserves your own thread's uh, forward progress guarantees. And if you don't do this, you, you end up in, in a bad place because if your concurrent thread is blocking on something else that it doesn't know is going to, to complete, then your thread has lost its own forward progress guarantees. So when a thread boosts block on some other thread of, set of threads, the forward progress guarantees of at least one of those other threads that it blocks on needs to be temporarily upgraded to the forward progress of the calling thread. And you repeat this process until the blocking condition is satisfied. So let's look at some examples of this. Okay, first I should mention this. So boost blocking ensures that your children threads make progress, but it does nothing for your sibling threads. So here's a uh, bad implementation of a thread, uh, which is just essentially a std function. And I, I'm calling this thread lazy thread. And when I call join on this thread, if the thread, if nobody else is called join, then I just invoke it. And otherwise, I just throw an error. So this does boost blocking. Because if I call this from a concurrent thread, I'm, if I call join, then I'm blocking on this. And what do I do in join? Well, I execute this other thread in the concurrent thread. So I am deferring, or I am boost blocking to that other thread. I am giving it use of my concurrent forward progress guarantees. All right, so another example. Um, imagine we have a thread pool with a single queue of tasks. So each worker thread in the thread pool executes a loop like this. So the loop checks if the queue is empty or if like, we're done executing. And if it's not, then we pop the next task from the queue and we start executing it in the worker thread. So the tasks in the queue can be thought of as threads of execution with parallel forward progress. Once they start executing, they'll run to completion. This is assuming, of course, that the worker threads provide you with concurrent forward progress. So once this task here starts going, we know that it'll complete. But these other tasks here, we don't know that they will run to completion yet because they haven't started executing. We don't know that we're going to have resources to run them on. And so let's, let's look at an example of 
of where you may run into problems here. So let's say that we're invoking some task with our thread pool, and we want to parallelize the work within this task. So we're going to launch some children that will do some part of the, the work that we're doing. So here I'm, I'm inside of the, the function that I'm sending to this pool. I'm going to launch two more tasks in the pool, and then I'm going to go and do some other stuff while I wait for them to complete, and then I will join on both of them. So what's the problem here? Well, what if our pool just has one thread in it? So what happens here? Well, this first task gets enqueued, and then the one worker thread in the pool starts executing this task, and it adds two more tasks to the queue, and then it goes and does some other work in this task, and then finally it calls join on the first task that it enqueued. So it's going to go wait for that first task to complete. Now, if we haven't done anything clever in join, this will just block forever because we only have one worker thread. There's nobody else to execute the children tasks. So what has to happen is in the join call there, we need to not just wait for that, that, the, those children to complete. We have to go and execute other tasks from the thread pool. And we have to keep doing that until the condition of joining with this particular child has completed. And so if you have an implementation of this thread pool that's like that, then this will be just fine even with one thread. All right. So brief summary of what we've talked about. So the C++ execution model boils down to threads evaluate expressions that access and modify flat storage. Evaluations within a thread are, are ordered by sequence before relations. Interactions between different threads are driven by synchronizes with relations. And forward progress promises that eventually everything terminates. Uh, there are some caveats. Uh, the first is that everything I just said is C++ 17 and beyond. We didn't have forward progress guarantees really properly codified in the language before C++ 17. Also, there's this thing called std memory order consume that I mentioned nothing about in this talk because std memory order consume makes all of the things that I showed you a lot more complicated. Like that diagram I showed you of happens before gets a lot more complicated with it. But y you don't need to worry about it. If you understood this without memory order consume, you have the basic understanding of how it works. Memory order consume is complicated and doesn't work on most platforms. It's kind of broken right now. We're trying to fix it. You can mostly just ignore it. Pretend it doesn't exist. And that is it. So we've got a little bit of time for questions. Yeah. OK, so concurrent forward progress means that the thread will run to completion. So as soon as you create it, it will run until it's completed. It has some dedicated resources ass assigned to it. Now, those dedicated resources might be virtualized by the operating system. But if, but if it is, then the operating system is one that guarantees that eventually it will, it will give your thread time to execute. It will not indefinitely delay the execution of your thread. Parallel forward progress guarantees mean that once you've started executing, so like once your task has been pulled off of a queue in a thread pool, and it, once, it's been, once you've started executing it, it will run to completion. But it is possible that, that, that your thread will never get allocated resources to execute. And weekly parallel guarantees say basically, even if you've started executing, it's possible that your thread's execution will be suspended and will never be resumed. Other questions? Yeah, right there. Are there any significant changes planned for the execution model in C++20? Um, no. There are a few new ways to achieve synchronizes with, um, because we will have barriers, semaphores, and a few new atomic functions. Nothing fundamentally changes, though. Um, there may be more changes further down the line to accommodate things like shared memory um, and launching processes, which would require introducing a notion of like external things to the C++ abstract machine. The C++ abstract machine doesn't really have a notion of that today outside of a volatile. But nothing in 20. Got a question in the back. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, 
Um, yes. So they're all not the ones in the... Well, thread local storage is part of the language. I'm not sure what you... Um, yes, you can access your, like, if, if I have the address to the thread local entity, I can access it from the other threads. It's just difficult to get that address. But, like, if I've got a thread local variable, and if, I ca if, if in a thread I take the address of it and I pass it to some other thread, I should be able to access that memory. Yeah, there was another question behind you, I think. Nope. Yep. But, sorry, what type of data? Like, like things like what? Ah, uh, yes, concurrent data structures. Um, actually, my my study group is currently reviewing a proposal for that. Um, it, I think that will happen eventually. It is in the pipeline, not in C++ 20, but down the line. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, go for it. Um, no, they are not. Not, not, not with the current the current wording of C++. That would not be a conforming implementation. You can't, you, the question was, can you use a, like a local processor cache to implement thread local storage? The answer is you can't. The way that x86 does this is usually using segment registers, um, but, but it's just to regular memory. Other questions? Yeah. Um, so how far away are we from having thread priorities in C++? So there's this thing called executors that I work on, which is a whole framework for abstracting execution in C++ and for introducing notions of other types of threads. Like today, you really just have std threads and main threads in C++. You don't really have any ways other than the parallel algorithms to spin up other types of threads that have different execution guarantees. Once we have executors, we'll have a whole framework for this. And you could presumably write an executor that has different priority levels. I'm not aware of any efforts right now to try to standardize access to operating system priority levels. So like to expose a priority mechanism for std thread. I don't know if that's coming. Um, I suspect that would probably be difficult for us to find a, a, uh, a subset of functionality that works the same way across all platforms. Um, so the short answer is yes in some forms and probably not in some other forms. Yeah, in the back. Um, what is memory order relaxed useful for? So one of the most common use cases is if I want to just like count things. If, if, if the only information that I want to transmit to other threads is the value of the atomic itself. That's what some, when memory order relax is useful for. So like if I just want to like, like a counter to count up, you know, how many transactions have been completed. It's good for that. Um, anytime when you are, when you, when you need to fence access to memory, so like when you're using the, the, an atomic to, to signal that some, some other memory is ready or to signal that, that something's been stored somewhere, that's when you need a stronger um, guarantee. And also any time that you need like strong ordering guarantees. Um, yeah, that's quality of implementation. Um, I, I mean, I, I think, yes, you, 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 you could write an implementation that way, but um, there's, there's lots of ways that you could write a nefarious implementation of C++. That's not the scariest one. 
Okay, I think we are out of time. If you have additional questions, I will be here.